Welcome to the Project Endure Podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that what you wear has the power to change how you feel? Project Endure Apparel is designed to remind you that easy won't make you stronger and that growth is an uncomfortable choice that we all have the privilege to make every day. Look good, feel good, and perform good. Head to the link in the show notes to shop Project Endure Apparel and keep on doing hard things. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 48. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very special guest down in Anguilla, Peter Ward. Peter, how you doing, man? Can't complain. Another beautiful day in paradise. So tell us where Anguilla is and then introduce yourself because I don't think most of the, the listeners know. So Anguilla, it's a small little, uh, first, I call it the dreamland. Um, it's well known for its beaches. Um, it's a small island, um, about 16 miles long, three miles wide at, at, its, long, at its widest part. Um, we're about five miles uh, north of St. Martin. Um, so one of the most northern um, Caribbean islands, um, but quite also northeast. So you're pretty much on, on the top of the, the backward sea of the Caribbean. Um, again, it's well known for it has 33 of the world's best beaches. Um, and is known for having, you know, some nice resorts on the island is really cool place to uh, call home. Yeah, it sounds beautiful. And, and then, uh, Peter, how did you end up in Anguilla? So it's kind of been a, a little bit of a journey, but uh, real estate, you know, I call it the blindfolded roller coaster of careers because you never know where it's going to take you or what you're going to get and in, in, get yourself into good or bad. Um, I was doing real estate in New York City um, and then had um, a, a colleague who, um, did some work out here in Anguilla and it piqued my interest. I came out here and immediately fell in love with uh, the island. And um, just like I do kind of with everything, I kind of go for it. And um, everyone kind of said, no, I said yes. And it ended up, you know, turning out to be, you know, the best decision I've ever made and, you know, getting to spend COVID out here. Um, and yeah, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a great experience. Um, it's special island, really great people. If you've never been out here, I highly recommend coming to visit. Um, it's a place like no other. It's private island feel, but with some, some things to do. Um, you can't go wrong coming out here. That sounds really special. Now, we got connected through a mutual friend, Wit Rasmussen. And uh, Wit told me, he's like, Joe, you got to get this guy, Peter, on your podcast. Uh, he deserves to have his story out there. He deserves to be in front of more people. Um, and your podcast would be perfect. And so I was like, if Wit says so, then Wit says so. And so here we are. And so, Peter, admittedly, I know a little bit about you, but I don't know a whole lot. And so why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and to me, and then we'll dive in from there. Well, yeah, my name is Peter Ward. I'm 35 years old. I'm a real estate agent. Um, I sell uh, luxury branded residences. Um, that's kind of the niche that I fell into. Um, I was born and raised in Massachusetts, spent some time in New York City, and kind of in, in between there, I uh, have uh, started to dabble with the um, endurance side of life and get into kind of these um, special events. Um, I've always been athletic, never, you know, didn't do anything crazy in college or did nothing in college, um, did no sports or kind of did the, the party route in college. Like a lot of us, you know, who did high school sports kind of got to college, you know, and felt fell out or only did a couple of years and, you know, got involved with more of the fun and, uh, aspect than anything. But ultimately my, um, story kind of, it's, it's unique in a lot of ways and kind of how, how I got started. But um, I guess in, if we're going to generalize, you know, my life in a nutshell, um, there are some, there's some stories in between um, that we may or may not get into. But, you know, again, like a lot of people, I was in New York, quite unhappy, you know, doing real estate, 
and um, I came across David Goggins' book. Um, I also came across David Goggins on Tom Bilyeu's uh, YouTube channel. He did a great uh, interview early on that really had got me to open the book. Um, read that book, and from there on out, the rest is history. I uh, signed up for the New York City Marathon, checked that box. Um, while training for that, um, I actually read David Goggins' book, um, and probably like yourself, you went pretty hard the couple of days after reading it. <laughs> um, and I've always, again, I've always been somewhat athletic. So I read David Goggins' book and I went out and I ran 10 miles around kind of around Manhattan from where my apartment was on 39th Street. So I guess it was technically like 11 miles. Um, so pretty much without training out of nowhere, I went and just ran 11 miles and came back and I did it. It was hard, um, but I felt amazing. Next day, went out there, did it again. So, so here I am, um, two days in a row of not training. I just ran, you know, 22 miles and completely wrecked myself. So within just a couple of days, I've signed up for the New York City Marathon. It's not that far away. Um, ran 22 to 23 miles in two days after never really running. You know, I'm, I was good at soccer or tennis, um, but never did track and field or anything like that. But because of that, ended up in uh, having to sign. I was like, I got to train. So I ended up signing up for uh, New York uh, Racquet Club, which had a health and racquet club without a pool. So then I started getting in the pool as of just training and getting on the bike. Um, and that led me into, um, I guess, some, uh, somehow that kind of led me into a wormhole online and back on YouTube, watching David Goggins, reading his stuff, watching the motivational bit videos. And then all of a sudden the Iron Man stuff came up and I was like, okay, well, I'm here and I'm here doing this, you know, this is pretty cool. However, I can't, you know, I can't um, run right now because I just jacked up my, my body and just running the 23 miles. So I decided since I was in the pool and I'm doing the bike a lot, hey, I might as well sign up for an Ironman too. So full length. So I, long story short, I ran the New York City Marathon, completed that. Um, it was hard, um, a lot harder than I thought. And then I ended up uh, signing up for, um, or was signed up for the, for the Ironman soon after and signed up for the Ironman Lake Placid and kind of jumped right in and, um, that's kind of where I'm still at now is continually signing up for um, races that are well beyond what I think my capability is. And, you know, you don't know what you can do unless you sign up for something and do it. Um, so signed up for Ironman Lake Placid, um, spent a lot, of the, a lot of time on Zwift, on the bike, hours and hours and hours um, in my uh, apartment in Manhattan, just sweating puddles on the floor because, you know, I was, you know, I didn't love riding outside. Um, so it's, it's a nice, nice way to get a lot of miles in and um, did a lot of running in preparation for the Ironman. Unfortunately, the pool situation wasn't so good. You know, the community pool in Chelsea where, you know, you had only a certain time during the day for lap swim and then trying to train for an Ironman fit a weird swimming hour in. So the swimming didn't really, um, didn't work, work really pan out, but ended up doing the race had uh, went out with the front of the pack because sometimes we're, where we make bad decisions um, and you learn from them. <laughs> but I had a panic attack in the water right at the beginning of this Ironman um, had to go on my back. So honestly, within a minute and a half of starting the Ironman, I went from going to thinking that I was going to compete, not with the pros, but do really well to thinking I was going to have to, uh, throw in the towel, literally a minute and a half, maybe less than that in, I'm on my back, um, panic attack in the water. So can't breathe. And I'm kind of just literally floating in the floating on my back, trying to watch out for everyone, uh, coming to absolutely, you know, run over me in the water. Ended up doing my two laps in mirror Lake in Lake Placid. It was a long, long swim, but got on the bike, um, happened to be pouring rain on the bike and it, I actually worked out for me because I did a decent amount of training um, on the bike, rain or shine. And I was, you know, I, I grew up skiing and, you know, kind of 
doing more of a, you know, fast sports. So I was actually really comfortable. So I cruised on the bike. Um, the run was another interesting story. You know, I could real I could extend this Ironman story to this whole podcast, but I ended up taking salt pills for the very first time, or it wasn't salt pills. It was like a, a tube of salt. I forget the company that makes it. And uh, I was like three miles in on, on the run and I took the whole entire tube of salt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing over here because I know exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about the salt that you, you're supposed to like lick your thumb and get some salt on your thumb and then lick off. Right? Exactly. Yeah. It's like a little, a little tube, but I, I was like salt perfect. Dump that. That gave me a hole whole bunch of issues, but ended up making it in. I think I did it in the Ironman Lake class in around like 11 hours and was just, you know, in shock that I was able to do it. And also at the same time, kept opening up for, if I can do this, what else can I do? Um, and without getting too much into it and just the intro here, um, I'll let you have me ask me some questions. Um, from there, I ended up getting into, you know, after doing Ironman, you kind of, really figure out what sports you do and don't like. Um, You know, you find out if you like swimming, you find out if you like biking and you find out if you like running. And um, after doing the Ironman, I really decided that I didn't like the swimming, the biking I'm decent at, but again, I'm a little, I don't, you know, there's some danger in biking that can come from outside sources. Like it's my fault if I trip on a route and fall, but you know, if someone hits you on the side of the road, there's just a lot of danger in biking. So I kind of decided that, you know, I really enjoyed running. Um, and then there's this great um, mountain kind of running scene, believe it or not, in New York um, called Red New Racing. They have a bunch of uh, trail races um, in kind of some of the areas surrounding New York City, about 30 minute, 40, maybe into an hour or so train ride out of the city. Did a couple ultra runs, whether it was, you know, 50 Ks or um, some significant trail race, a little bit over a marathon and and really caught that bug, signed up for a hundred mile race in Arizona, made it 96 miles in this race. um, And I couldn't finish after 96 miles, believe it or not, I was absolutely so jacked up, signed up um, for another hundred mile race after a after a whole nother story of me getting lost in the woods in New Hampshire and having to kind of fight for my life and clawing through this crazy um, river. But that's another story. Eventually did I, I, eventually I did complete a hundred mile race. um, And then from there kind of moved out here to Anguilla. I've been here for a few years. And then um, two years ago, I signed up for the Cocodona 250 um, I failed at about the hundred mile mark and had to, um, had to DNF from that one, which is never fun, but you learn and, uh, a DNF will certainly build a fire inside bigger than anything possible. So, you know, the day Cocodona 250, um, was open for registration again, I signed up and then kind of made it my goal of the year to train for that race, um, and in, in, in between, you know, as that race got closer and I was, you know, really getting into it, uh, there's always been this race called Tour de Chants. Um, that's considered one of, if not the hardest race in the world, even though every now, every day they're coming out with crazier and crazier events. But it's a very well-known um, event in Italy. And I was able to get a bib, which is kind of difficult to get a bib. So I decided that I would do this crazy Tour de Chants. And that's that kind of brings up right up, excuse me, to today. So, man, there is so much to dig into here. So, I'm going to go out of order a little bit with the normal line of questioning. And I'm going to come out and ask you what's the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose? Is it one of those things that you already described? Is it something outside of the world of endurance sport? And whatever it is that you choose for your answer, why did you choose to do that thing? And in general, uh, Peter, why do you choose to sign up for things and pursue things that are almost bigger than your capabilities at the time? So I think the hardest thing I've ever done on purpose is the Cocodona 250. That's the 250 mile race that takes place in Arizona. Um, 
that was just by far something that I've never done from a sleep deprivation to, um, to pretty much everything. I mean, you're just, you know, you're, you're testing your mental toughness, you're testing really everything you have down to your core. Um, you know, it's always hard to answer why for these things. Um, I, I found that in the, like, when I did the marathon, you know, I, what, I didn't train like a crazy, like you would think you'd have to train for a marathon and I was still able to achieve it just kind of in different ways. And I think a lot of the problem is, is that we just don't, we don't believe in ourselves enough. We don't respect the fact that we can do things, you know, we just automatically assume, Oh, Iron Man, I'm gonna have to train six years to do something like that. And when you keep throwing yourself into these, you know, circumstances, you learn more and more every time. And I find it, um, I think when we talked last, I was on the uh, Stairmaster on like a two and a half hour Stairmaster master mm -hmm. session. To me, I would never do that if I didn't sign up for something so great. So it, it, in and of itself, I'd rather, you know, I'm doing that so I'm not stranded on a mountain in the Alps with, you know, by myself and having no strength to, to get either back or to the next life base. Um, it's, it's a lot of um, getting yourself mentally prepared, but then owning and enjoying the success that you get out of finishing that this workout. So you know, signing up for these things, you know, really forces me to train harder to do things, which then in and of itself lets me do harder things down the road. Um, and then trust me, no matter what, I mean, it started with a mile, you know, when I first got in, I, I remember running a treadmill full for a mile, it was the worst thing ever. But you know, every little thing will every step adds up. And you know, you learn from it and you really, you start to enjoy it. Um, and that's kind of one aspect of it. If I can switch to the other aspect, I found, I guess New York city marathon really isn't the best um, example, but with trail running, we live in such a crazy world right now. I mean, phones, you know, I don't have TikTok, but I have all the apps that do what TikTok does. And, you know, the endless reels of videos and distractions. I find that when I get myself on a trail for a long period of time, uh, becomes like a meditation. And with that, I, and that's from someone who has, who struggles just to, you know, I like doing things. I'm very active. I struggle to sit there. I always feel like I'm wasting time with, with when I'm meditating. But if I go out in the woods by myself on a long trail run, you got to pay attention to every single step that you're taking. It's like a forced meditation. So I almost look at it as people go out on these meditation retreats, whether it's, you know, you're going to go, you know, do like an Aubrey Marcus thing and, you know, go take ayahuasca down in Colombia or wherever that, you know, you go on these, you know, meditation retreats. My meditation retreat was the Coca Dona 250. So, you know, I think there's, and then there's so many layers to this onion, Joe, I could go even deeper and um, on reasons why I can, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, I continue to choose these crazy events because it puts, it forces me to train and work harder. You know, the, you know, aim high, miss high kind of concept. It, you know, even if you fail, you've, you learn so much. Um, so I hope that answers your question without me repeating myself too much. Oh, it was beautiful, Peter. And I was trying to find this quote. Um, I didn't find the one I was looking for, but I found a different one that serves the same purpose. And it's by Gary Ryan Blair. And he said, the distance between those who achieve their goals consistently and those who spend their lives merely following has everything to do with one's ability to go the extra mile. And I think when people think of leadership, they think of how one person might lead another person or another group of people. But I think true leadership starts with how we lead ourselves. And it's clear that you lead yourself 
into these uncomfortable situations uh, toward your limits. You're leading yourself toward your limits. And my question for you is, because this all makes perfect sense to me, and I think anybody who uh, frequents this podcast understands why you do what you do, but what about the fear of failure? Does that exist for you at all when you set these huge goals? Are you ever afraid of falling short? Of course. Um, you know, that's, but that's why you, you know, I think I live afraid. And that's why I was on, I go on the stair mill for two and a half hours. You know, you're, you're, you're afraid of, you know, you don't want to let yourself down. You know, everything is confidence. Okay. You know, so if you don't achieve your goal, you're not going to be happy. So there's, you got to be, you know, smart, you know, it's kind of like if you have a to-do list during the day and you don't do everything on that to-do list, you're probably not going to be as in a good mood. But if you have a, if you have a to-do list and you do everything and then some, then you even, you respect yourself even so much more. And if you, if you don't, pretty much the fears we don't face become, become our limits. Um, and that's, that's the background of my computer. So, you know, if you're really, and that's a big lion. So you, if you're, if you don't, if you're not scared of it, um, then, then I'm limited by it. You know, it's really, um, yeah, I guess that's kind of the best way to sum it up with, um, and you got to really yeah. just fall in love with the struggle of um, knowing that you might not finish, you might fail. Um, but that's the best part, you know, what I think it's Tony Robbins is all about certainty, you know, it's, says, you know, every, we all crave certainty, but if we were all, if we all knew what was going to happen at every second, life would be really boring. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah. uh, Dude, that line, can you read that line again, the background of your computer? What does it yeah, say? So it says the fears we don't face become our limits. Damn, that's beautiful. I love what you said too, about just feeling good about getting things done. And it, it brings to mind the phrase, um, discipline weighs ounces, regret weighs tons. But I think it's, it's easy to put off the discipline and say, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with regret when it gets here because it's not something that we necessarily experience right now in the present moment. It's different than the discomfort of discipline. Um, but it's true. There's a lot of truth there. And I think the cool thing about endurance training and really anything that has to do with fitness is that just like to build muscle or to build physical endurance, you have to continue showing up and pushing limits. And if you stop, you start to lose ground. I think our confidence is a lot of the same. You have to show up and do the things you said you were going to do. And when you stop doing that, you start to lose confidence in yourself. And that's why I think fitness, endurance training, whatever you wanna, whatever you wanna do within the physical realm, it's such a great confidence builder, not necessarily because you look better or because you can run faster. Yeah, sure. Maybe those things add to that. But I think at its core, it's about showing up and doing hard things consistently and feeling good about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, the thing is, you kind of got me thinking of, so say I signed up for a 50 mile race, those workouts leading up to it. I could skip those. And then it's just going to be, you know, a, an effect because I know I can. So I can skip those because I know that I can do these things. And I think we don't push ourselves enough to keep ourselves moving forward. You know, I'm, I've done, I've listened to a lot of Tony Robbins. Everyone has their, you know, their viewpoints on Tony. Um, I think he's great, but one of his main core principles, I like to get very basic with things. Progress equals happiness. Happiness equals progress. And in my eyes, what, what better way to constantly make progress is A, by running, which is literally one foot after another, which is legit the definition of the word. And then adding on these really hard events that clearly people, tons of people have finished before. Why can't I finish? And then that just, you know, you set your goal so high and you have a race that you're paying a lot of money for. You don't want to go out there and have to, DNF, uh, you know, 10 miles in because you can't handle the altitude. So it kind of forces you 
to be disciplined, um, kind of like these military guys, you know, they, they're all disciplined, you know, as much as, you know, they, you can watch YouTube videos and motivational videos, they're disciplined because they have to be disciplined because they're, they can die, you know, they're going into battle. And it's the same thing. I feel like in our, in our everyday life, we just get set in these ways of comfort. Um, and trust me, I don't love suffering. Um, I know that on the other side of it is always good things, but we do all try to avoid it. And I like how this is a sport and, or just endurance in general is something, um, that you can kind of use as an asset, um, to be able to, you know, use suffering and not have to deal with, you know, whether it's like death or, you know, anything horrible happening, it's a unique way to keep yourself disciplined, um, in a way that will ultimately keep you fulfilled because that's why what we're doing all the time is we want to be fulfilled at the end of the day. And in order to be fulfilled, we need to be happy. And how do we, how are we happy back to Tony Robbins, you know, progress equals happiness. So as soon as we stop making progress, so I'm kind of screwed here, Joe, because I mean, after Tour de Jeans, I'll have to find, <laughs> Find, uh, find what's the next one. They have tour de glacier, which is tour of the glaciers, which is 450, but you know, you do that. And then, it, and then, and then at the end, then, you know, hopefully life gets a little bit easier, but is that the point we're back in comfort because life's easy because you've done all of these hard things. Um, what's making your bed in the morning. You know, if you've run a hundred miles in under 24 hours, you know, just everything's perspective. Um, I have so many thoughts. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so you've, you've totally thrown me off my game here uh, because normally we'd be going through these questions pretty steadily, but this is great. So episode four of this podcast, Tony Reyes told me the phrase, comfort is a slow death. And ever since it's been on my office wall, it's been on my phone, it's been everywhere. And I think there's so much truth to that. When we get comfortable, when we get complacent, it's a slow death. Because what is life without discomfort, without progress, without struggle, without moving forward against some kind of resistance? I think it gives life some kind of a richness that you just can't find any other way. So that's one. Two, I think hard, hard is relative. And my favorite thing about hard things is that as long as you continue to push those limits, hard is hard. And so for you at the beginning, two back-to-back -back 10 or 11-mile days, that was hard. And now that might not be that hard, but you can still find that level of struggle that you're looking for by going out and doing something that is now your level of hard, whether that's running 100 miles or 250 or someday 450. Uh, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about life is we can find our limits constantly. They will always be there if we look for them. And then my last thought, and then I'll let you bounce off this. Anybody who's listened to me talk before, uh, there's a good chance you've heard this story, but bear with me because it's a good one. Um, in the state of Colorado, it's one of the only places in the world where cows and buffalo exist in close proximity. And Colorado is a relatively flat state with a big mountain range that runs through the middle. And so storms form over the mountain range. And when the cows see a storm coming, they turn and they run in the opposite direction. They run away from the storm, away from the mountains. And eventually the storm catches up with the cows and they're stuck in the storm. They're moving in the same direction. When the buffalo see a storm approaching, they turn toward the mountains, they turn toward the storm and they run directly into it. And what happens is because they're moving in an opposite direction of the storm, it actually passes more quickly. And I think what you described just facing fears and not letting those fears become limits is truly about turning toward the things that scare us, turning toward the things that maybe we don't want to do, but we know we probably should, and doing them anyway. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on any or all of that, because I think you probably got a lot to say there. Yeah, um, you know, I think running into the storm, you know, you and you learn every time. The first time it's going to be scary, you know, and then, uh, you know, over time you, you learn, okay, you know, I, I've just got to put up with this for a little bit, a little bit hectic, you know, the wind speed might be faster if I'm running this way. Um, but every time you're learning and building, you're making mistakes. Um, usually, but you know, now 
we all know you learn from your mistakes. It's very, you know, so if you're not doing things that you're going to fail at, how are you going to get up next time? So, but once you underst understand that, you know, that you can get through that storm and, and you, and you build your, your strength, you can almost get like a, you know, so now they're, I guess you know, the bulls are extremely tough, you know? So if you continue to do these, these tough things, you're almost like getting, you know, sometimes I say old, like doing ultra, doing ultra marathons, you're really getting your PhD in mental toughness. I love when I heard that. Um, and if you're mentally tough, you know that you can handle these, these storms and you just got to go right through them, sign up for the big, big event that you know is going to break you down. Um, but on the other side of that is, is, is greatness, you know, is, is freedom. You're, you, you, what, what is it like? Um, I think it's like the quote, once you run, a, once you finish a marathon, you realize that you can run an ultra marathon. Once you run an ultra marathon, you realize that everything is possible. Um, and it kind of, yeah. So I, I would, I would, I would, I like that story as it's the bulls kind of have that PhD and uh, mental toughness. Yeah, absolutely. Now, since we already touched on this, you said to you, endurance was putting one foot in front of the other. When you hear the word endurance, is that the first thing you think of? Is there something else that comes to mind as well? And you could extrapolate also to life outside of endurance sport, or is that just the same definition, no matter what? I mean, endurance is a pretty basic definition. You know, it's being able to endure hardships, endure um, difficult things at difficult times. I mean, there's so many endure can, you know, you can, and there's so many different ways that you have to endure, whether it's through family members, death or an ultra marathon, you know, there's, it just is such a wide, um, widely used term that you could put towards anything, you know, um, patience sometimes is something that you need, you need to endure, um, things and be patient to get through them. Um, where was I going with this? Um, but I guess endurance to me is kind of, it's getting, getting to that point where you can't go any further and yet you take that next step. Okay. And every one of those next steps, you know that you can't go any further, but you continue to do so. Um, and endurance to me, I like to try to kind of ball it all up into, I think it's like a Jocko Wilnick. I think that's his name. Um, his, his kind of somewhat of his strategy is, you know, you do, you, you do all of this, like your to-do list and you're going to feel great. You do all that and you do that one more thing you're going to feel life is going to explode for you. So endurance to me is doing that one extra thing. So whether it's, you know, I have a two and a half hour um, Stairmaster workout on pretty good speed, not holding on, you know, it's hard, it's boring. It's very easy to give up early after an hour and a half. You feel like, okay, I'm, I'm good. You know, you've seen 30 people come in and out of the gym and you're still on that thing. People are looking at you crazy. Um, but even if you, even if you, so if you get off first, you're not going to feel satisfied. Even after a, a long period of time, you get off at that. You, you did the work, you did the work. Okay. You're there. But endurance is taking that and doing, making that two and a half hour, even just two hours and 35 minutes, just going a little bit further every time. It's a little cliche and, you know, endurance is keep moving forward, but it's going further after you've already gone far. Um, and completing stuff, completing something that you don't necessarily need to complete. Um, so it makes you feel, so it gives you the self-confidence to then, um, continue to, um, endure other things. It's a very, it's a great word, great name for a podcast too. I don't know if anyone's looking. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate that. And, and I love that definition and it goes hand in hand with, uh, bear performance nutrition's motto. Uh, which is a company you may or may not know of. If you don't, you, you definitely should. Cause I, I, think I, I know Nick's stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So go on more. Right. Um, and it's just, uh, 
it's such a universal applicable definition of endurance that anybody can put toward anything in life, whether it's the to-do list, the workout at the gym, the run on the trails, um, just doing something nice for your spouse or significant other when you don't feel like it. And when you've already done a lot, when you've already unloaded the dishwasher, just vacuum, vacuum the living room, right? Just do go one more. Do one more thing. Yeah. And so I usually ask this next question first, but since we were in a rhythm, I saved it for now. We're going to circle back and we've talked about a lot of hard things that you've done on purpose. Uh, What is one thing, maybe the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle in life? Uh, Something that you didn't get to choose. Something that I didn't get to choose. Um, It's a great question. Um, I really haven't had too many life altering difficult events. I've been very fortunate. Um, I've had some grandparents um, pass away, but I guess the hardest thing that I didn't choose, but I can relate to kind of all of this. And I think is the big reason that, you know, there's a lot of layers to that onion of why is that I am the youngest of uh, three. I have two older brothers, um, both extremely successful. Um, They were both extremely intelligent. Um, Both were valedictorian of the private high school that we all went to. They both uh, went to Dartmouth College um, graduated top of their class. One is now, you know, a doctor at Mass General and the other one works for Ray Dalio, um, hedge fund Bridgewater. So they're just been very successful. And I've always, I've always been compared to them, um, no matter what. Um, and I've always kind of felt like I've, I've had to push harder, um, whether it's not having a photographic memory, sorry, you know, you know, so I've always had to do things. And I think that's really where I've built a lot of um, uh, this endurance from is, you know, constantly being, you know, looking up to them, but also trying to achieve great things as they did. And now I've kind of found um, my own, my own path. Um, but in that being said, it's, it's, it's a unique situation where um, it's really helped me. Uh, I'm trying to think of how, how to best say this, but it's, it's always been, um, been kind of a struggle being not, you know, kind of the third, third in line and behind these two um, that were just so successful. And always, always here's now I'm, I remember what I want to say. Um, and now it brings me to like that comparison. Okay. And I think it's a huge problem with where we live in the world today. So my biggest thing was comparison. I would always compare myself to them and comparison is, you know, not, it, it's good in some ways, but in a way now we live in the society, we're always comparing ourselves to other people and we don't know what's behind it, what goes into it. We just see these things. Um, so I think comparison is a big, is a big issue and um, can also lead to good things. Um, but we need to realize that, you know, you, you just, you have to start um, and you really can't, you can, anything is, anything is possible as cliche that, as that is. Um, and then you can do big things on your own and you just got to stop comparing yourself to others and, you know, be the one that goes and does those things. Um, once you start comparing yourself, um, you're, you're going to, you're going to be in for some rough times. So I guess that would kind of be, um, if that answers the question. Yeah, that's such a relatable concept that to be honest, nobody has brought up in that way on this podcast we're almost 50 episodes in and i think it's really interesting because just listening to you speak right up until this point i would have had no idea that maybe in comparison to your two older brothers you would have ever felt like you had something to live up to or maybe something that you wanted to achieve to put yourself on the similar level of somebody above you. Maybe you would put, put that in your mind. Like, is that how you picture it that your brothers are above you in certain ways outside of just being older? I mean, kind of. Yeah. 
um, I'm not sure anymore. Um, but from <laughs> certainly from like my fa- like my father's eye- eyes and wanting to make him proud, um, I've always felt, you know, not like they have made made him more proud. And then if I, I had a big um, if you want to read my caption of my Instagram post, I have, I hugged my dad at the end of um, Coca Dona 250 and kind of wrote this long post on um, this topic specifically. And you know, not that I was I needed validation or I was running this race for validation or I wasn't doing it for for them, but it was really the first time in my life that you know I really felt that you know I he was genuinely like proud of me outside of anything that you know he has been for, for my brothers. And it was a really special moment um, for me and to have him as a part of it and be there and support me along. It it was, it was really special. Wow. And that was, that was the race that you DNF'd, correct? So Coconut. Yeah. So I signed up um, after living out in the Caribbean on frozen mojitos and you, you know, all of the beer and just, you know, maybe running three miles a day maximum. Um, I had a quick, May is usually the slow month in the hotel um, business. So it was uh, a chance that I could get away. It happened that that race was in May. And I said, screw it. Um, I, at this point, I did a hundred mile race, but it was, you know, a year or two before then, because um, this was after COVID. And I signed up and was doing great, um, but just absolutely just blew up at about a mile, at about hundred miles. And, you know, that was, that race meant a lot to me. I was going to propose um, after the race. Um, I had big plans, you know, you really see yourself finishing, um, but it's it, not finishing that race and having all of my family, friends travel out there to support me and then not, getting even past the day really um, lit a fire in the inside. And from that point on, I quit drinking. Um, I had this huge goal like I've kind of had in the past. And I think I had a little gap, um, a huge goal with a purpose. And I wanted to finish, you know, I saw other people finishing. I'm like, if, you know, there's a reason why I didn't finish. And, you know, it, it built discipline, um, whether it was from waking up at, four in the morning and literally putting on the movie from the previous year, the, the YouTube video, you know, Dylan Harris, shout out to the Coca-Dona video from the inaugural year. I mean, I've probably watched that video hundreds and hundreds of times. I'm probably responsible for a 10th of the YouTube views on that video, but I would just, you know, it was when you put so much into it and you, you, you put an emotion with it. I think the emotion is key. Um, it's tough to do every, anything unless you're emotionally, and I was emotionally connected to finishing this race. So I would get up four in the morning and start doing um, squats with a you know 40 to 60 pound rucksack on in my bathroom, looking at um, my bib from the previous year um, with a thing on the wall, the Bob Proctor thing. I'm so happy and grateful now that, and you know, Um, It was, I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm the Coconona 250 champion. That didn't happen. Um, But I finished on the, uh, on the, on the following year, which was a few months ago this May. Um, I went back out there for redemption and and had one hell of an adventure. Um, Even with all the preparation I put in this year, I mean, not drinking really every single day I I worked towards finishing that race and it was still um, a hell of a battle. Mm, man, that's so cool to know that didn't work out the first time you used that as fire for the second time and you got it done after putting in a tremendous amount of work. It sounds like, uh, to go back really quick to the comparison topic, just to extrapolate to, uh, life in general. And maybe we look at social media cause that's something you and I are both familiar with. And really anybody listening to this podcast is likely familiar with, you know, I think for comparison, It gets really tricky because like you said, we see somebody else's highlight reel and we don't get to see everything else behind the scenes that maybe isn't going great um, or that person's not proud of. And we just have this assumption that everybody else's life is just sunshine and rainbows, right? And our life is not. 
Um, and I think that's, that's a real problem for a lot of people. So outside of comparison, maybe to your brothers, do you face that in the world of endurance sport or just life in general in real estate and what you do for your profession? Do you feel like comparison affects you in a negative way outside of the family dynamics? I think it used to. Um, I'm learning how to not let it affect me. Um, but outside of, you know, I, I, again, it's another cliche thing. You got to stop caring what other people think. Um, and one thing that really has um, kind of let me do that is I'm, you know, really just trying to um, enjoy the passage of time, whether it's good or bad. Um, as long as I know that I'm putting in the work and setting these high goals, um, it's for me to be the one who, who's there enjoying it. And when I start putting comparisons on it, um, it really takes away that, that joy because there's always out there, you know, someone doing better. Yes. People think people are like, Oh my God, you're amazing. How do you do what you do? And then in my head, I'm like, well, the guy did the whole Appalachian trail in 42 days. He ran, you know, this far. So, you know, but it's kind of trying to, to see that understanding your point um, of trying not, you know, how we all, we don't realize that, you know, everyone's not getting up or everyone's behind the scenes is not always perfect. Um, you know, people, people say, we may look at someone like us with your YouTube videos with your, or your Instagram videos with your um, weighted vest on in, in your um, kettlebell but they didn't see what your brain was telling you before you went out there, you know, and all those emotions and words that you were telling yourself and how you felt. Yeah, you, you may look like a stud on the camera and you're, you're great. You're, but, you know, it might have taken you a few reps to get in, to get into it and, and, and get it going. So um, I've learned a lot through comparison. Um, and I think it's a good thing, not in the amount that we have it today. I think we're constantly, that's all we're doing is comparing ourselves. Um, but it also comparison helps you um, see reality too. You know, it, who, people used to think that, you know, a lot of this stuff was impossible. Um, whether it's, you know, running for days and days and days, people doing these 24 hour or these last man standing races, it's truly incredible what, um, you know, it'd be a lot harder to sign to be like, Oh, I'm going to run around. I'm going to climb 25 mountain passes in the Alps and, um, have a, almost a hundred thousand feet of elevation change in this one week. But, you know, there is a little bit of certainty, you know, knowing that there'll be, you know, a thousand other people out there with you, um, that you can compare yourself with, but it's good to have the comparison to know that they're out there and know that there's harder events and, um, we could get into a whole book on um, comparison, um, but it's certainly a big part of my life. Um, and I think that's what has driven a lot of this um, maybe excess. Speaking of writing books on things, I think comparison is a great tool, like you said, to understand that things are possible. Maybe to look at somebody else to your left, to your right and say, oh, I've never thought of doing it that way. Let me try that thing. But I think where we get into trouble is when we desire somebody else's life, uh, when we compare to the point where we start putting ourselves down. And we're all writing different chapters of different books in different genres. And to compare my chapter of my book right now to your chapter of your book to somebody else's chapter of their book is just doing a disservice because it's not one-to-one. -one. It's not the same thing. We all have our own stories. And I think when we can use comparison intentionally as a tool, as a transient tool, um, it's good. But when we get fixated on what other people have or what other people are doing, and that starts to negatively impact how we perceive our own life, I think it becomes really dangerous. So I like, I like what you thought there. Yeah. I mean, you can just uh, finish the loop on it too. I mean, I even look at some of my, you know, close friends or my best friend who, you know, he's, we were best friends and now, you know, I'm doing, you know, a lot of these crazy things and now it's got him being like, Oh, okay, I can, I can do that. You know, he just did a big 75 mile bike ride um, this weekend. So if you're, you know, you see people close to you do things too, it really kind of can also 
um, compare, you know, comparison can lead to um, people getting up off the couch and, um, you know, maybe putting the drink down and. Um, could, could we have inspiration without comparison? Could inspiration exist without comparison? I almost think no. Yeah. That would be a good chapter title. For the book. <laughs> <laughs> one day, one day. Uh, well, with that being said, Peter, so people listening to this podcast are in all different places, all different life stages, going through all different kinds of things. And so this last question is really special to me because I truly feel that words can change somebody's life. I know I've had instances where words from somebody that I didn't even know have changed my life, whether it was a motivational video or a podcast or a speech or whatever it was. And so I want you to imagine that you are speaking directly now to the person on the other end of this podcast um, with your voice in their ears, and they are potentially going through something really challenging in life. Um, it might be a tough season. They might not know where to go or what to do next, and they're just feeling stuck. What would you say to that person who now you are speaking directly to uh, through this podcast? There's a lot there. Um, I think if you're doing something to avoid something that's painful, then, then the pain itself is, is running your life. Um, so I really, you know, whatever it is that, that is hurting you, you know, run into that storm, um, go at it, re- try, to, try to figure out why you're feeling the way you are. Um, you know, there's, there's ways that you can um, get through it. Um, also one of my favorite things, and um, I am currently writing a book and this is what it's based. Um, it's called, it's going to be called um, running to fulfillment. Um, and one big aspect of it is the polarity aspect. Um, and, you know, everything has, has its opposite, you know, in order, you know, winning isn't as good if you've never lost, you know, you need, if you, you can't, you can't experience happiness if you've never you know, had sadness, you know, you need to, you need to suffer to, you know, to really, to feel the greatness, to feel the freedom, to feel the ecstasy. So if the time is bad, um, it's gonna, it's gonna be good. Um, I think Tommy Reeves and Rich Roll had a great podcast, um, which he really hit this point um, hard on. Um, And he was pretty much saying like, you know, we're all happy you know, and, but, you know, when you're happy, you got to be prepared that there's going to be, you know, this, this period of unhappiness that's going to follow. And if you're not in a good spot, you just got to know and deep down understand that it's not always going to be like this, you know, um, and then pushing that to kind of, you know, the one foot and, you know, learn to learn to enjoy these, these times, um, as it will be freeing you. If you really learn, if you learn and then, you know, bringing it back to, um, yeah, I guess the, you know, relentless forward progress and you'll get there and the good, you know, there's, there's no bad without good. There's no, you know, the polarity, you know, I never understood the yin yang when I was younger. I thought it was just a weird symbol, but when you start to understand more about, you know, each side, you know, you need each side needs its opposite and, and really just to, to hang tough through it. Um, yeah, that's, um, you gotta fall in love with the struggle to fall in love with life. Yeah. I've got an Og Mandino quote to wrap that all up, uh, which it was so well said, Peter, uh, Og Mandino said, I will love the light for it shows me the way, yet I will endure the darkness because it shows me the stars. And uh, I just think it's so true, right? You think of a seed. I love this analogy. Um, I've probably spoken about it at least a dozen times now in this podcast, but you know, a seed gets planted under, underground and there's darkness around that seed. And it's not that the seed was buried, a seed is planted. And the seed is planted because it has something inside of it that enables it to grow through the dirt, to find the light, 
to um, use the darkness around it as nourishment. Uh, whereas if you put a rock underground, a rock is buried because there's nothing in that rock that will allow it to grow. But I think the human spirit is, is much like the seed. And when it's planted in darkness, it will find a way to the light. It will grow, but it has to be in that place first in order to grow. And I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that, like you said, the good times come and they will pass and the bad times come and they will pass, but they, they serve a purpose and you truly can't have strength without struggle. You can't build resilience without resistance. And we need to learn to enjoy and embrace the ups and the downs because that is what makes life so rich. Beautiful. You could, yeah. Thanks, man. That could be the uh, that could be the forward to your book. I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> let's, kidding. <laughs> let's link up. Let's go. So let's get that done. Um, now, but with that being said, Peter, uh, two things. One, what is the next race on the calendar for you? And then two, people want to follow along, or if they want to reach out and connect, where should they do that? So um, the next race is going to be, it's called the Tour de Giants. I briefly mentioned it earlier in the podcast. It's called the Tour of Giants. It's a 200, technically 330K. People who've run it before said it comes out to about 215 to 230 miles with about 85 to 90,000 feet of elevation change. It's in the northwest corner of Italy called Aosta Valley. Starts and finishes in Cormier and you do a, a counterclockwise loop around the Aosta Valley. Um, it's for reference, it's kind of considered the big brother to the UTMB, the ultra trail Mount Blanc. So Cormier is, um, just, um, on the other side of Mount Blanc, but in Italy and not, not, um, UTMB starts in Chamonix, um, but they're quite close. So they're kind of like, um, Tour de Jantz is kind of the, the big brother of UTMB. I would have loved to do UTMB. Very difficult to get into now. It's one of the most popular races. So this one was, uh, was you know, an, a, another kind of, um, you know, flagship race that I wanted to do and um, or a bucket list, as some would call it. Um, so I saw the opportunity and took it. So it's definitely I'm no, I mean, I live in Anguilla, Flat Island, the highest um, we the highest point is 200 feet above sea level. Um, hot weather. So, you know, it's 85 and sunny and perfect literally every day. So I become quite soft when it comes to the weather, but I'm excited for the challenge and um, to be prepared. Um, I'm certainly going to be putting um, some links and stuff and tracking. Um, if you're interested in my Instagram is PJ Weezy, P-J-W-E-E-Z-Y. And that's probably the best place if you want to uh, follow me or follow along um, this next race and um, whatever adventure adventure comes next. Awesome, Peter. Well, I can't wait to see what you do. And uh, thank you so much for your time tonight, for this conversation, uh, and just for everything that you do, because I know a lot of people are watching and a lot of people are inspired by it. Uh, so keep up the great work. Dude, I love your podcast. I mean, every time I've listened to probably about five episodes now, um, and every one that I've listened to is I've, I've taken away a lot from it. So keep doing what you're doing. I know um, doing a lot of these is endurance in itself. So um, I love the fact that you're doing this and I enjoy following you on uh, social media as well. It's fun to, you know, see you working every day hard at what you do and managing life, family, relationships. Um, we all have, you know, different, different chapters that we're all in right now. And the Joe this year is going to be different than the Joe next year and um, vice versa. So thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure and um, I hope I didn't ramble too much. No, man, this was perfect. Thank you so much. Awesome, Joe. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing, if you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.